Troops of the American First Army crossed the Rhine south of Cologne at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Berlin has fallen. Marshal Stalin has just announced the complete capture of the capital of Germany, the center of German imperialism, and the cradle of German aggression. This is the BBC Home Service. We're interrupting programs to make the following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangements between the three great powers, an official announcement will be broadcast by the Prime Minister at three o'clock tomorrow, Tuesday afternoon, the 8th of May. In view of this fact, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as Victory in Europe Day and will be regarded as a holiday. This is London. The Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Winston Churchill. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Force and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight. Tuesday, the 8th of May. How the memories all come rushing back when I hear those historical recordings signaling the beginning of the end of World War II. I'm Stuart McPherson, one of the 14 BBC war correspondents who reported the triumphs, the tragedies, and the disasters of battle to a nation that was hungry for news from the front. Forty years ago today, I was home in London and was privileged to share a moment of time when the war-weary people of Britain could for a day forget the austerity and their personal grief so they could join in the jubilations, for at long last, peace was at hand. There were still to be many months of fighting in the Far East, but this was a time of hope. On Sunday, May the 6th, in General Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims, France, were four military personnel. They were summoned for a special assignment. One of those four was a Londoner, Susan Hibbert, she had been selected to type in English the historic surrender documents which would bring about 40 years of peace in Europe. I was working in the ATS at Supreme Headquarters in Reims. We all realised something was happening, but it was only when we were sent for by some of the officers to go to a room quite separate from where we normally worked, where there were four typewriters. There was one Russian typewriter and a Russian interpreter and we had three typewriters. One was typing in French, one in German, and one in English, and I did the English one. And all through the day, we were brought papers and documents, and they were checked and typed and retyped and rechecked and put to one side and torn up and taken away and brought back. The documents were very long. Yes. They had to have all the details of where the ships had to stop, what had to happen to every... German regiment, every, uh, all the British, where the British Army were to stop, where the Americans were to stop, and also, of course, where the Russians were to stop, although we didn't see that because that was done by the Russian interpreter um, who was in the corner of the room quite separate from us. We couldn't go anywhere. We had sandwiches brought in. And we, when we typed the documents, we tried to keep copies, but we were not allowed to. But on the back of, of the one that was actually signed, I wrote very, very small, tiny little uh, initials, which I doubt if they're still there, but uh, they were on the day. <laughs> Eventually, late that night, we actually typed the final copy of the surrender document. By that time, we were all exhausted. We were allowed to watch the actual signing, and there were a lot of um, American and British officers sitting at the table, they stood up, the Germans were marched in, they stood 
and they just uh, said nothing. I mean, nothing at all. They just signed, looking very quiet, very tired, very dejected, very sad. And they signed, and then they left looking um, very much the same. And the British officers and the Americans were very quiet too. But afterwards, of course, when everyone left the room, then it was quite different. Then they were all very excited. We drank Verve Clicquot champagne out of some mess tins which were brought to us by some of the other people there. And then thankfully went off to bed where we slept. And I slept all through VE Day. I remember nothing until two days later. And then I sat up and said, I think the war's over now. Momentous decisions were being rushed to a conclusion in high places. Sir John Peck, one of Winston Churchill's private secretaries, was ordered by the Prime Minister to contact President Truman on the secret transatlantic phone line. The President had already sent a wire to Stalin suggesting that the three powers agree to declare VE Day on Tuesday, May the 8th. So far, there had been no reply, and Mr. Churchill was getting impatient. The crowds were getting very excited. Sir John Peck was put on to Admiral Leahy, President Truman's chief of staff, and he passed the phone to the Prime Minister. He couldn't hear awfully well. His uh, hearing on the telephone was not very acute. And after a few minutes, he handed the telephone over to me. He said, I'm handing it over to a younger ear than mine. (laughs) And uh, so I explained uh, again what Churchill wanted. And uh, Leahy was explaining to me that uh, he thought that President Truman would not be able to act without getting any reply from Stalin. So at this stage, I I was relaying this to Churchill, who was obviously getting more and more impatient. And he finally grabbed the telephone and talked direct to Leahy himself. And uh, his deafness uh, miraculously disappeared for the purposes (laughs) of this conversation. The upshot of it was uh, that they would have to leave it until the next day. The Americans were quite insistent on that. And um, Churchill himself quite saw the point. So for the moment, it was uh, left at that. But then later in the afternoon, when um, the crowds were gathering and there was more and more excitement in London, Churchill suddenly said to me, go and get the president on the phone. Tell him I've got to announce something now. Well, I knew perfectly well that (laughs) I wasn't going to be put through to President Truman. What Churchill was really worrying about was that uh, if there was still no reply from Stalin, and Stalin obviously wanted to delay the thing to the ninth, Churchill was a little bit afraid that in the interests of solidarity with the Russians, the the Americans might themselves postpone VE Day till May the 9th. So um, this was what I was instructed to go (laughs) talk to President Truman about. I had what turned out to be a rather bizarre conversation. The substance of it was, look, about VE Day, we definitely want to end the war tomorrow. (laughs) And uh, Leahy said, well, sure, we want to end it tomorrow. So I said, right, we end the war tomorrow. And he said, yes, OK, fine. And um, I think that was the last exchange about VE Day before VE Day actually happened. May the 8th dawned, blessed with good weather. Huge, excited crowds were gathering all around the country, especially in London, where such familiar landmarks as Whitehall, Piccadilly Circus, and the Mall were jammed with humanity. Everyone was waiting for 3 o'clock when the German war would be at an end. Memories of that precious, exciting moment are etched indelibly in the minds of a war-weary nation.
Prime Minister has made the historic statement of the end of the war in Europe. The ceremonial sounding of the ceasefire is made by the buglers of the Scots Guards. We were stuck out in the beautiful Norfolk countryside at a little airfield called Matlask. And we were really kept very busy right up until VE Day because our job was to make life uncomfortable for the Germans who were left behind in Holland. So we did that energetically and a good deal um, enthusiastically. And then um, came the great stand down. You remember there had been rumors about the war going to end tomorrow or the day after or, and all that kind of thing. And we were stood down at last. So we thought, whoopee, the war's over. So we all climbed into a, a little vehicle we had, an, an Austin Tilly, and went down to one of our favorite local pubs, which was in a village called Corpusty. And by the time we got there, the place was full with all the locals, even there was miles away in the country. And some old lad looked up and saw us come in, flying boots, uh, battle dress, scarves, floppy hats, you know, the lot. And, and in we came and this old boy said, here are the fellas has done it, he said. And before you could say knife, they picked us up with the intention of carrying a shoulder high round this pub which was quite a good idea, except that the ceilings in a country pub were pretty low. And even under the ceilings, there were these huge black beams. And they bounced us round from beam to beam. And Jolly did, Near did us more personal harm in five minutes of V-Day than the Germans had succeeded in doing in the whole war. remember VE Day, I was at school in Wiltshire and we were in the cookery room having a laundry lesson and it was a lovely sunny morning and my friend had been ironing her mother's underwear and she'd ironed a hole, a big iron size hole in her mother's big blue knickers and of course this was consternation. What am I going to tell our mum? I've burnt her knickers. And of course, it's, it's funny now, but in those days, I mean, the clothing was short and the coupons, I mean, I don't know how many it took to have a pair of knickers on coupons, but the fact of this hole, and Jean was worried. What am I going to tell our mum? And we were worrying all through the morning, trying to think up excuses. And then suddenly, into the room, strode Pop, our headmaster. And he didn't knock, he just came straight in. And he walked up to the cookery mistress and announced something to her. And she beamed. And they turned round and announced that the war had ended and peace had been declared. And, of course, the, the classroom just erupted. I and mean, you can imagine news like that. And we were all sort of rejoicing, you know, I suppose laughing and yelling. And this plaintive little voice, now I can tell our mum I burnt the knickers, I forgot to switch the iron off. And we all laughed and laughed. It was so funny at the time, and it's one of those things that just stuck in my memory. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, we were loading coal onto the conveyor, as we always do in the afternoon shift. Every now and then, somebody would say, I wonder if the news has come through yet. For days, rumours of peace had been coming through. Suddenly, the noise of the machinery stopped dead. And we heard the voice of the boy at the gate come ringing down the face, all out. And this time, we knew it was the real thing. There was a pause for a second, and then we all rushed. If you can imagine 20 men rushing along a tunnel, four foot high. Well, anyway, it didn't take us long to get to the gate. And there we saw the first in the journey of black drams lit up by the powerful blast lamp with an enormous white V chalked on it. And underneath, 
peace in Europe. The thoughts of a famous fighter pilot, a Wiltshire schoolgirl, and a Bevan boy on their great day. Meanwhile, Sir John Peck had now completed arrangements for Mr. Churchill to make his triumphant journey to the House of Commons. Churchill went down through these crowds. The uh, police sort of swept away through for him in an open car to the House of Commons. And um, Leslie Rowan, the senior private secretary, and myself followed behind in uh, one of the big closed cars. And that, frankly, was for us a rather terrifying experience because, of course, the crowds closed round behind Churchill's car as it uh, went through. We couldn't see out of ours because um, there were people sitting on the roof, on the running boards. It was sort of uh, like a gigantic ant heap trying to be shifted through the crowd. Anyway, we finally emerged in the, in the peace of Palace Yard and um, the Prime Minister made his deeply thankful little speech in the House of Commons. And, uh, of course, everybody cheered and it was a very emotional occasion. But they then, uh, he led the procession of members of Parliament across to St Margaret's Church, St Margaret's Westminster, for a short service of thanksgiving. Let us pray. We give thanks to thee, O Lord our Father, for the call to do battle for the right, for the unity of nation and empire, for the maintenance of faith and hope in the darkest days. We thank you, O Lord. For the steadfast support of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, for the wholehearted loyalty of the colonies, for the trust and cooperation between the Allied nations, for the mighty help of Russia and the United States of America. We thank you, Lord. Throughout the land, the relief and joy knew no bounds, but there were places that did not share this great feeling. This is Winford Vaughan Thomas reporting to you from Germany. Here in the old town of Lüneburg, we are standing in the main square where the Germans have assembled. The RAF have been flying overhead. But we've got no flags or bunting out. Instead, a single white sheet of surrender hangs from one of the town hall windows. And under the windows, the leading citizens of Lüneburg are standing waiting. Behind them, our lorries and Bren gun carriers are passing in a steady stream. And there's an endless line, too, of German soldiers the disbanded wreckage of the German army. But no one even bothers to notice them anymore. They tramp by on their own bat to the nearest prison camp, and even the citizens of Lüneburg don't lift their heads to notice them. The war, for them, is over. In Germany itself, it was a cloud over everybody. They were grey people. Uh, the reversal of fortune had come, in a curious way, faster than they were accustomed to. They were still thinking that they were holding them on the Rhine. They were still thinking that the Reich was going to survive. Yes. And suddenly the whole catastrophe fell on them. The collapse of the front, Hitler's death, everything. And I think they ceased to be a people who, so other than just stand, look on dumbly. This was a North German town, typical North. It hadn't been badly bombed. And I would never forget, once that, this was signed, Monty's signature. Then a day later, all the inhabitants of Lüneburg were called the town square and the burgomaster stood up and then the terms of surrender were read. As the voice was echoing over the square, in the background were the drabs of the wrecked German army still drifting away back home. They'd, nobody cared anything. You looked, there was the Wehrmacht. Its pride gone. 
it was no longer a group of supermen, and they were fine soldiers, let's face it. But this lot looked as if, well, they never wanted to see soldiering again. They chucked everything, their guns away, everything gone. And they were just drifting against the background of this rather powerful um, reading of the terms of surrender and, and the proclamation of victory. I didn't have the heart to shout or cheer in front of those Germans. No, I didn't. You can't, you can't rejoice. You can't. No. And I felt the need afterwards at about five o'clock, oh, let's get back to the boys. Let's celebrate. We have won the war. Yes. We should yeah. do it. Yeah. And uh, I went from mess to mess. There was a whole lot of units there who welcomed me. And we had a most wonderful time. And the singing went on and... Uh, what the Germans outside, because many of the messes were in comedy houses and the rest of it. It uh, must have been awful for them. It wasn't too much fun for Jack Fraser either. Jack was a dispatch rider with the Gordon Highlanders until he was captured in June 1940 when he became a prisoner of war in Stalag 20B. The food was mostly potato and water. And... It was the black bread. The loaf was about the size of a house brick, and that had to do between five men. If you misbehaved, you didn't get fed. We did eventually get a supply of Red Cross parcels, which was virtually what kept us alive. If it hadn't been for them, the majority of us would never come back. As it was, there were virtually thousands died of dysentery and malnutrition. The majority of the chaps were wearing Dutch clogs, big wooden Dutch clogs, and pieces of rag around their feet. And <coughs> most of us had to use the blanket that we had on the bed to wrap around us during the day to keep warm. We had no great coats or anything like that, of that description. But our biggest problem was food. We were virtually starving. And when the... I just don't know how to describe it, you know, to think we, we were all in one piece when the end of hostilities had come. It was something that he just, he couldn't come to grips with. And it took your mind back to the, the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds who had died on these forced marches and through illness and that sort of thing. There were staggering losses suffered by most countries for few had not contributed to the war effort. The feeling of relief at the lifting of oppression was reflected throughout the world. May the 8th was President Truman's 61st birthday, and at 9 a.m. American time, 3 o'clock London time, he broadcast to the American people. This is a solemn but a glorious hour. I only wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to witness this day. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity. Now the guns of Moscow have fired the greatest salute that this city of salutes has ever heard. Here are the voices of the guns and the cheers of the people in the Red Square as they were broadcast by Moscow Radio this evening.
went in through Mottertame and the Hague and flew over the lowlands. And I can vividly recall a young boy astride of his bicycle between the dikes, waving in one hand the Dutch flag and in the other the Union Jack. He was quite excited. And also on the roof of a hospital, we could see uh, nurses and doctors or people in white coats waving and shouting, and also on the dropping zone itself. They probably knew before we did. I was driving a lorry with German soldiers in from northeastern Italy at Udini, near Trieste. And there was that many prisoners and DPs that we worked for three weeks, roughly, night and day, without taking our clothes off. We celebrated uh, in this little village up in the mountains. And uh, we used to go to the village every night to the local cafe. And the uh, restaurant owner, the Italian, he had four daughters. And he used to get these long tables out, and I used to get all the lads, 20 of us. And now, come on, Giuseppe, which is Joe for Italian, you know. How about a song? So we used to start and sing all in rotation. And then we used to sing Amapola and um, O oh Marie. Well, they could join in with you on that song, because it was an Italian song, like. But well, we used to have some smashing nights then, right till about midnight. And then he used to say... I used to say, well, are we lads? Out in the village, line them up. I was only a driver at the time myself, like. And as drunk as we were, we used to bring them to attention, salute them, right turn, march up the village singing. And we used to come to the top of this hill while all the vehicle was down in this field at the below. And we just used to straighten down, lay on the floor like a carpet, and just roll down the hill. It was the quickest way down. Oh, we had some bad heads next morning, like. <laughs> also in Italy was Godfrey Talbot. Godfrey was one of the BBC's first war correspondents. He covered the Desert War and the famous exploits of the Eighth Army. It was in the far north of Italy where he witnessed some of the real horrors of war. He saw the mutilated bodies of Mussolini and his mistress hanging by their heels at a petrol bar. There the angry partisans fired revolver shots at random into the corpses. Girls who had cooperated with the hated intruders were stripped naked and shorn of their hair as they were marched through the streets, constant targets for sustained ridicule. So strong was the feeling of anger and resentment, May the 8th in Italy was to prove anticlimactic. Quite frankly, VE Day was no great news to us. And by us, of course, I mean the veteran troops who'd been fighting and beating the enemy all the way from the Mediterranean all the way up Italy to this point in the north. The German armies in Italy had surrendered, you see, six days before this VE Day. And what our soldiers felt when they got the official news that it is peace, this is VE Day, was, well, thank God it's officially over. But that was all. And on VE night... I do remember just once seeing some chaps uh, firing off Bofors guns into the air just in celebration, but that was all. There, there weren't any fireworks. They were just, well, I think quite honestly, most of us felt deflated and numb and, and limp and, and suddenly very tired. We, it's an odd thing to say, I know, but we missed something. We were bereft of the, of the tension and the chase which had been going on for so long. I did, as a matter of fact, on that day, get a radio link call through to our headquarters down in Rome. And a voice came back and I said, what about this uh, victory day? And uh, the voice said, no, nothing, excitement, no, nothing, niente festa, niente festa, no, there's no firework, nothing here. And then my colleague came on and said, dear boy, what do you expect? You remember, you know perfectly well, we captured the Eternal City one year ago almost, a day before even D-Day on the Normandy landings. He says, as a matter of fact, there's absolutely nothing going on here. I've never seen Rome so quiet. I'm going to bed early. Back here in Britain, the clock showed it was getting near 6 p.m., and Mr. Churchill went out on a balcony overlooking Whitehall 
and took part in one of the most moving and remarkable scenes of all the day's national rejoicing. At this moment, how wonderful Mr. Churchill has come out onto the Ministry of Health balcony. Now Mr. Churchill stands on the balcony of the Ministry of Health. He's wearing his boiler suit, the famous boiler suit that he's made so wonderful. And he had the audacity, shall I say, to put on his head his famous black hat. Nobody can say that it goes with a boiler suit, but you heard what a cheer it raised from the crowd. He stands now in the floodlights and he's giving the victory sign for all his might from the flooded balcony. This is your victory. Victory of the cause of freedom in every land. In all our long history, we have never seen a greater day than this. Everyone, man or woman, has done their bit. Everyone has tried None of print, neither the long years, nor the dangers, nor the fierce attacks of the enemy have in any way weakened the unbending resolve of the British nation. God bless you all. Now listen, the band is playing Land of Hope and Glory, and the crowd is singing. And this suddenly has become a very moving moment, for Mr. Churchill, too, is singing, and he is conducting the singing of this song. Will you listen, please? To one man, the day's happenings must have made him feel so proud. He and his family had stayed at their posts throughout all the hell of the past six years. His Majesty, King George VI. Today, we give thanks to Almighty God for a great deliverance. Speaking from our empire's oldest capital city, a war battered, but never for one moment daunted or dismayed. Speaking from London, I ask you to join with me in that act of thanksgiving. For Germany and the enemy who drove all Europe into war has been finally Overcome. When the king and queen and the two princesses appeared on the balcony after the king's broadcast, they saw the biggest crowd outside Buckingham Palace since the Silver Jubilee. It must have been a memorable night, particularly for the two young girls, 19-year-old Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, then only 14. For the first time since that day, Her Majesty the Queen spoke with Godfrey Talbot of her own personal recollections of this most unique occasion. I remember the thrill and relief after the previous day's waiting for the Prime Minister's announcement of the end of the war in Europe. And my parents went out on the balcony in response to the huge crowds outside. I think we went on the balcony nearly every hour, six times. And then when the excitement of the floodlights being switched on got through to us, my sister and I realised we couldn't see what the crowds were enjoying. My mother had put her tiara on for the occasion, so we asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. 
I remember we were terrified of being recognized. So I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. A grenadier officer amongst our party of about 16 people said he refused to be seen in the company of another officer improperly dressed. So I had to put my cap on normally. We cheered the king and queen on the balcony and then walked miles through the streets. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. I remember the amazement of my cousin just back from four and a half years in a prisoner of war camp, walking freely with his family in the friendly throng. And I also remember when someone exchanged hats with a Dutch sailor, the poor man coming along with us in order to get his cap back. <laughs> After crossing Green Park, we stood outside and shouted, we want the king. And we were successful in seeing my parents on the balcony, having cheated slightly because we sent a message into the house to say we were waiting outside. I think it was one of the most memorable nights of my life. Her Majesty the Queen. For many people, there was a great sadness underlying the mood of rejoicing, for they were thinking of the loved ones still at war in the Far East. At this point, the Japanese had shown no signs of contemplating surrender, and the casualties continued to mount. The Prime Minister was conscious of the many unsolved problems. He would often ruminate out loud about his misgivings, uh, because all through that period, all through VE Day, uh, there was this extraordinary contrast <clears throat> between the rejoicing and the public excitement and the rejoicing uh, that the war with Germany was over, and behind it all, his deep misgivings uh, oh. about all the unanswered problems that had to be grappled with. You see, within three days of VE Day, he was sending a telegram to Truman um, saying, we have got to meet Stalin again, because uh, he realized, uh, Churchill realized by then, that the Russians were making a complete nonsense of the Yalta Agreement and appeared not to have any intention of abiding by its terms or at any rate interpreting them in a highly Russian manner. Uh, Churchill was deeply worried about the danger of a very abrupt and massive withdrawal of the American troops from Europe. And you mustn't forget the, uh, the war with Japan was still on. There were estimates that there might be still be up to a million or a million and a half British and American casualties before Japan was defeated. Because nobody knew at that time whether the atomic bomb was going to work, uh, whether it would be ready in time, or what the effect would be. So the, the future, the real future, after VE Day, seemed to Churchill very, very bleak. Superficially, it was the great moment of his life, uh, and, well, more than superficially, but deep down at heart, he didn't feel it was a time for rejoicing. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. But let us not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, with all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. The injuries she has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States, and other countries, and her detestable cruelties, call for justice and retribution. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our tasks, both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. Heroism and suffering were not confined to the European theater of war. Hundreds of thousands of troops were engaged in bitter fighting, and thousands more were in Japanese prisoner of war camps. Private Dudley Cave of the Ordnance Workshop 
was captured by the Japanese on the eve of his 21st birthday, and Corporal Tom Thorpe was being heavily shelled as his battalion advanced through North Burma. I was going up this track, the battalion in file, and the Japs had been shelling intermittently, and there was um, a signal, a signal from the signal corps kneeling down at the side of the track with an RT set on his back and his earphones listening and spit and speaking into it. And he just said to me, hey, Corp, Corporal, come and listen to this. And I was listening to it. It was an account of the V-Day celebrations in Trafalgar Square. And I think it was probably broadcast from All India Radio. And uh, it was amazing to listen to it and, and you thought of home and... How nice it would be to be back home and to join in the celebration, you know. And it, it felt rather uh, disappointing to us to think that we were still at it. The Forgotten Army, we were still fighting. You were 9,000 miles away. You was in the jungle and the, the sweats and the heat and the flies. And it was an inhospitable country, you know. Uh, really a bad feeling, I think. Towards the, the evening, before the sunset, I heard this huge flapping noise in the sky. And we looked up and we seen these wild goose, huge in V formation, and the wings were flapping away there. I felt as though I wish I could get on the back and go on with them. You know? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I would like to dedicate my song not to the boys in Europe, but to those in the Far East. You're still very far from those you love and from those that love you. You still have other battles to fight, but we're thinking of you, praying for you, and wishing you well. When the war in Europe ended, I was in the hospital attached to Changi Jail on the island of Singapore. I'd got beriberi, malaria, dyspepsia, and couldn't keep food down, and my weight, which I'm proud to keep just below 12 stone at the moment, was just on 8 stone at the time. I heard the news from secret radio, and obviously was pretty moved by it. I knew already that it was near the end. I'd been waiting for it. We all had. When I got the news, I potted off to the little church and sat there for about 20 minutes, trying to sort my thoughts out and my thoughts of the future out. I thought about home, and I knew that the blackout was over, and in my diary I wrote at the time how wonderful it would be to have the blackout lifted and light streaming out of our dining room window and across the lawn. I also thought the neon sign would be back on again, but of course that was several years before that happened. There wasn't really very much to celebrate because it was really a rather frightening time. We didn't know what would happen with the Japanese. The Japanese might have fought on to finish or might have committed a sort of mass harakiri. The feeling of resentment about the war being over when the war in, in Europe ended hurt a lot of us, quite a lot. It hurt us considerably. There was a feeling of the forgotten army. Practically every soldier believes he's in a forgotten army. Uh, in Burma they felt it, we certainly felt it. And this, the idea of people celebrating at home while we were still there and there was a job to be done, that they were wasting time sort of leaping around in the streets when they should have been getting on ready to end the war and get us out. Memories of VE Day. For me, the day was spent in Piccadilly Circus, where I was to broadcast for close to nine hours the celebrations and the activities of a never increasing throng of merrymakers. It had been a long and unforgettable day, and I was not sorry to hear this final announcement. Now, for the last time tonight, we're going out to the streets of London to hear what's going on. So over to the hub of the empire, to Stuart Macpherson in Piccadilly Circus. Well, back here at Piccadilly, it's still the same old story. There's still a terrific throng of people, and there's still the wonderful crowd they were two and three hours ago. 
few moments ago, some members of the Royal Navy showed that their training hasn't been misspent as they shinnied up like monkeys up the lamp standards and planted firmly the Union Jack, the Russian flag, and the Stars and Stripes. A few moments later, there was a terrific flash of light. It was a Lancaster going over in the beams of a searchlight, and it got a cheer that tore the atmosphere to shreds here in Piccadilly more than it was ever torn even during the height of the Blitz. The crowd as still just packing every available inch. Myself, we're fortunate. We're up on the windowsill with every comfort, as it were. And it's a sight we'll never forget. It's almost been worth waiting for five years and eight months. I celebrated B Day in Piccadilly Circus. I was ever so pleased everything was over. You know, we'd have seen so much suffering, you know, bombing. I'd been bombed out three times. Once in Clapham Common, once in Whitfield Street, where I used to live and once in Mornington Crescent near the Black Cat factory. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, where I think everybody's going mad. They were glad the whole thing was over and our boys were coming back. And there was all other troops there, you know, of every other nationality. There was Americans, Canadians, Australians. You know, when, when you've had so many years and you've been, you know, through it rough, and we were buried alive in Tottenham Court Road in the Good Street Underground. Well, some time before they brought us all out. So I don't fancy ever being buried alive again, I can tell you. I remember sleeping down the undergrounds, stations at night. You know, it was pretty rough, but we all survived it. I was so excited, I climbed up a lamp post. I was on the top and there was a naval person underneath me and a Canadian underneath him. I thought the light was going to give way any minute with the weight of us. But I got myself really plastered. <laughs> That's the way it is in Piccadilly. It's joyful, carefree, and I, as a Canadian, will say this, without fear of contradiction, I've never seen such a delightfully, wonderful, good-natured crowd. And those bobbies, they really knock you right out because they haven't done a thing except that they've smiled occasionally. An MP car came by a few moments ago, and there, there is a really brave man, he's trying to ride a bicycle. And he's got half a ticket at least either pushing him or trying to join on with him. And everywhere you look is a maze of uniform colors, sailors, airmen, and soldiers of every nationality of the Allies. Well, that's the seed here in this historic night at 20 minutes past 12 on May the 9th. And with that, we say good night from Piccadilly Circus. And that was the way we were. Oh, how intoxicating those celebrations. Who would begrudge them? For over five and a half long years, people everywhere had been on the rack. With victory in Europe came the hope that the whole world would move from the past to the future, with some sort of sanity, leaving behind the horrible intrusion that had shattered and destroyed the lives of so many people. And may we never forget how many million were not there to share our joy. I'm sure all of you who remember the 8th of May, 1945, will have your own personal memories of that day, which you will never forget. And maybe in the past hour we have stirred a few that are long forgotten. There will be sadness in many of them, but may they also be peaceful. For this day heralded the beginnings of 40 years of world peace. Sadly fragile, and certainly never total, but may we continue to remember that time, so that our young never have to suffer the horrors of such a war again. Let's close the logbook on that day with a letter from Private John Frost of the 11th Armored Division, a letter from one young soldier to his mum. Dear mum, it's VE Day. Fighting has ceased. It finds Stan and I safe and well. We've much to be thankful for. Our celebrations will come when we walk up the garden path. I think it'll come before Christmas for both of us. This afternoon we all listened to Churchill broadcast over the radio. It put the official touch to things that it was all over. From the radio news, we've all learnt of the wild celebrations going on in London and other cities. <sighs> Wish I could see all the flags flying and hear the bells pealing. The rings sound nice over the wireless. I'm writing to you, Mum, from a village situated in northern Germany. It's permissible to tell you, because all the newspapers have told the news of this division's capture of Lübeck. The weather today has been glorious. I'm getting quite tanned. This may be due to the fact that every time I drive my vehicle, I keep the windows open. Along this road today have passed thousands more German soldiers and airmen. 
they drive their own vehicles, they look battle-worn and completely tired. They prefer to give themselves up to us than to the Russians. Also on the roads, making their way from the Russians, are hundreds of German civilians. Those that have horses and carts have household belongings piled up on the carts. Many are walking, women and children too. VE Day is very different in Germany. This is our third week without bread. It's biscuits and bully beef, not forgetting good old tin sardines, pilchards and powdered potatoes. There's no beer for the boys, so VE Day is just another day out here. In a few moments the king will speak. The hut here is crowded. There are several German beds in here, for it was formerly a German soldier's billet. The radio's German too. The reception's excellent. Some of the boys are in bed writing letters. Others are sitting up, and all ears are open. The anthem has just played. The major is present. The speech is over. The king has certainly improved in his manner of speaking. The news is now on. I'm sure you too are listening, Mum. And so, Mum, I come to a close. What the future will be, not many people know. But let's pray that this is the last war in Europe. All my love, your loving son, John. <laughs>